Anytime we have a checkout uh, on orbit, there's a lot of products that go into that. We have uh, the, the, the training products that we have to create. We have crew come over and uh, get trained up on the robot. They, they dry run the procedures. Uh, we also have a lot of real-time ops products that have to be created. There's an entire flight ops community that we're interfacing with. And they, everybody has to be brought up to speed on what's going to happen, what's to be expected, how much time's going to occur. That all has to be coordinated ahead of time so that when things are happening real time, uh, everything's expected uh, in terms of what the robot's going to do, what its next actions are, everybody's on the same page. And so it takes an amazing amount of time and preparation in order to, uh, in order to achieve that, that level of understanding between the ops community. Then there's the technical side to it, what we're trying to accomplish on the robot from a scientific point of view. And so all that has to be married together because we have our milestones as researchers in the lab and the ops community has standards in which they need to achieve those milestones and so we're trying to bridge uh, those two worlds together on this unique payload such as Robonaut. This milestone uh, for, for Checkout 1 and 1.5 was, was particularly important because it was the first time the robot moved under its own power. The previous uh, checkouts that we had done really looked at just booting up the robot systems, making sure that everything uh, from a sensor point of view, from a, from a computer point of view, had survived ascent to the space station as, as we expected it. So we, we powered up the, the, the computer systems, we looked at the thermal signatures, and because uh, we, we wanted to take things slow, um, and, uh, and we've become very satisfied with the state of the robot, and so checkout 1.5 was okay let's let's get that robot to move and, and go through the adaptive learning script to, uh, to, to tune the software parameters on how it moves in, uh, in zero-g. So that was a huge gauntlet that we had to go through because we're not flying a fancy computer we're flying a robot to assist the crew with, uh, with their daily activities and, 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 and other activities in particular that, that, we, that we feel a robot could, could better serve you know cleaning things um, and uh, assisting the crew from that point of view. So we ultimately have to get the robot to move. And so this was a huge milestone because it means that all the systems, and there are hundreds of systems that are all cross-checking each other, sensors that are cross-checking each other, that have to work in order for the robot to even begin motion. So our checkout yesterday was uh, looking at the differences between how the robot's going to work in uh, zero-g and uh, how we've been testing it uh, on, on the Earth in one-g. The robot was going through and, and moving its arms uh, one by one, moving each of the joints in its arms to understand the differences between operating in one-g and zero-g. The robot's actions are controlled by a set of software parameters, and those software parameters have to be adjusted between here on Earth and in the space station. And so we had the robot go through and adaptively learn the differences between those, those uh, software parameters. There's a certain choreography to it of, of how we, uh, we interact with the crew, because we don't talk directly to the crew, and, uh, and how we have to discuss. Uh, we have our Robonaut flight controllers, and they, they discuss uh, the actions and what's going to take place and any off nominals that we might have with uh, specific actions and so those those have to get sent up to the crew and then the crew and their observations are sending down to uh, the flight controllers on the ground what they're observing and so there's this nice little dance that has to uh, that has to occur and, and plus we're doing commanding both from the ground and on board the station so uh, with yesterday's events uh, for example uh, Mike Fossum was actually commanding the robot on uh, on the station and so he was initiating the scripts and he was loading the scripts that were uh, having the robot run through and, and, and like, like I mentioned, uh, adaptively learn its game parameters for, for operation. And But at the end, we had the ground stow the robot. And so there's, a, there's this nice trade-off and this dance that has to occur back and forth and a lot of real-time ops that are happening in, in coordination. So Checkout 1.5 is what we accomplished yesterday. And uh, it was a very exciting day for, for our lab in particular, uh, all the flight controllers that we had on the ground watching the robot and the crew. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see Mike Fossum in, in some of the video, but he was a very excited individual uh, running that robot, and then we were equally excited watching him run that robot. It, you can sort of already get the sense of the relationship that the crew and Robonaut uh, could, could have in the, in the future. He was, uh, he, you could tell that Mike felt very, uh, like the activities that we were doing with Robonaut represented this new age that we're trying to usher in, with, which is having the crew and a highly dexterous humanoid uh, work together. 
and uh, we, were, we were just so genuinely excited to see his enthusiasm. And the events couldn't have gone any better. Uh, we, having, the, having the first humanoid robot aboard the ISS uh, move under its own power was, was really a momentous day. It was really tough to contain our emotion because you're supposed to be this stoic, uh, have this sense of, of uh, you know, seriousness in the, in, the, in the control center, but yet we were grinning from ear to ear like kids in a candy store, uh, just uh, having the most wonderful time watching the accomplishments that were being done before us, and uh, it, was, uh, it was quite exciting.